His name came to me during a reverie. Roland Mallet. I saw him draw breath as I exhaled. I knew him. I knew him to be suffused with life and desire, yet reluctant to live. An American gentleman so fearful of causing harm that he banished himself to bachelorhood and inertia. One could say that he is lost. Quite lost. I am lost. It is comfortable being lost until I am reminded that my heart is empty of purpose, my soul devoid of companionship. How empty are my days? How hollow my nights? Roland Mallet, we are no one until we have proved our worth, our value upon another soul. Until then, there is neither darkness, nor light, nor definition, nor purpose. I have a sense of irrevocable loss. I will give you what you need. The occupation of love, a chance to satiate desire, and to that purpose, I shall direct a young, restless, and uprooted Virginian towards your settled procrastination. A young man with an untried soul of tremendous potential. An artist. What is art but the desire to allow others to see with your eyes? To allow another soul into the understanding of your heart? Requires bravery. Let me be brave. Let me take life by the hand and brave the world. Yes, here are clapboard houses, gardens loud and bright with the bombast of late summer, as Roland Mallet, a wealthy Bostonian without a guiding interest, arrives at the Northampton home of his young, widowed relative by marriage, Cecilia. Committed bachelorhood has honed him for the solitary life. Matrimony seems such a thing full of sunlight. And Roland Mallet, as I have said, craves the shadows and their dark illumination. He hopes to turn his directionless desire into the freedom of doing some good. Cecilia, my dear. Roland! Oh, I was expecting you at evening. I shall say you have arrived to divide the evening from the afternoon. Do they require division? Uh, everything is about beginnings and ends. You are shortly to leave for Europe. And your veranda is the jetty from which I will depart for the old world. <laughs> uh, lemonade? Thank you. What do you mean to do in Europe? The same as I do at home. No great harm. <laughs> Perhaps I'm holding myself back for a grand coup, a lightning strike of inspiration. You are afraid to act. I, I should have said, my dear Roland, that your nerves were tough. That your eggs were hard. You have an aptitude for beneficence, that's for sure. I am unable to tell the wrong cause from the right. Mm. I'm tired of myself, my own thoughts, my own affairs, my own eternal company. And true happiness, we are told, consists in getting out of oneself. But the point is not only to get out, you must stay out. And to stay out, you must have some absorbing errand. But I just don't feel ardent and passionate about a hospital or a dormitory. You know, I... I sometimes think that I am a man of genius half-finished. Genius has been left out. <laughs> I fear I shall spend my life groping for the latch of a closed door. What an immense amount of words. You want to fall in love. Well, I'm not inflammable. <laughs> Boston has failed to promote a spark. Are there any you know, damsels here that you think might... Uh, no. <laughs> I can think of no one. I may not be able to show you a pretty young woman, but I can show you a pretty boy... Behind you. A bronze statuette. Oh! Wh why didn't I notice this before? I mean, you were launching clouds from your cigar like a gathering storm. May oh. I look at it? <laughs> who made this? It's a little thing of Mr. Hudson's. And who the deuce is Mr. Hudson? <laughs> you are smitten. <laughs> Can one love an object? Uh, who did you say made this? Mr. Hudson, a young neighbor, made it. It's called Thirst. How old is he? 23, 24. He's from Northampton, Massachusetts. The family moved here from Virginia after the war. And he's a sculptor by profession. Roderick Hudson is a law student. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he could be induced into doing something for me. Oh, this was a matter of friendship. I saw the figure, admired it, and then on my birthday, Roderick arrived in a buggy with this. 
Upon my word, Cecilia, he does things handsomely. <laughs> is it very remarkable? Why, my dear cousin, Mr. Hudson of Virginia is extraordinary. <laughs> is he a great friend of yours? I regard him as a child. A clever child. I should like to see him. He hasn't visited for a few days. I'll ask him over this evening. We ugly mortals. What beautiful creatures we are. Cecilia, my pleasure. You walk too fast. You do everything too fast. I know it, I know it. I can't be slow if I try. <laughs> There's something inside that drives me. I call it a restless fiend. <laughs> oh, it's hot and dusty and my shoe pinches. Perhaps a cup of tea will restore your equanimity. By keeping me awake all night? It's hard enough already to go down to the office with my nerves set on edge. <laughs> your cup of tea would make me stay at home and be brutal to my mother. <laughs> your mother's well? Oh, she's as usual. And Miss Garland? She's as usual, too. Everyone, everything is as usual. The usual is all I can expect in this benighted town. I beg to differ, Mr. Hudson. Things do happen sometimes. For example? <laughs> For example, here is my dear cousin arrived to congratulate you on your statuette. Is he hiding? Roland, climb free of the hammock. Let me introduce you to Mr. Hudson. I hadn't realized that I had already met him. His statuette is a self-portrait. How do you do, Mr. Hudson? Your statuette seems to me to be very good. I can see from your look that you were wary that I should give an idle compliment. You almost haven't. <laughs> your statuette has given me extreme pleasure. And my cousin knows what is good. He is a connoisseur. A connoisseur? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Then you're the first I've ever met. Let me see what they look like. <laughs> Come further into the light. <laughs> Have connoisseurs all such good heads as that, Cecilia? I have to admit that my cousin is the only one I know. <laughs> I'd like to model it. Will you sit for me, sir? You won't be able to for a while, which is a shame. I should like a reason to keep him here. Oh? I'm off to Europe. To Europe? Happy man! I have a repulsive routine at the law office where I work. Honestly, I he rattles on office. for an hour and with unconscious boyish ease, giving his opinion on 20 topics. And I sit in silence and watch him and Cecilia. And then... Look, Mr. Mallet, did you really mean what you said about my little statuette? Yes. It's essentially good. That's the beauty of it. I have a notion that you really know what you're talking about. But if you don't, well, it doesn't much matter. My cousin asked me if you knew yourself how good it is. Perhaps not. Tell me, Roderick, do you mean anything by your young water drinker? Well, he's a youth, so he's innocence, mm -hmm. he's health, strength. Oh, yes, he's curiosity. <laughs> he's a good many things. And is the cup, the, the thirst, also a symbol? The cup is knowledge, pleasure, experience. Anything you could think of. Well, he's guzzling in earnest. Hi, poor fellow. <laughs> he has the thirst. So, good night. Good night, Cecilia. Roland, it's too confusing to call you Mr. Mallet and Mrs. Mallet when you're just cousins. <laughs> good night, my little statuette. I leave you in safe and admiring hands. <laughs> that boy is an artist to his fingers' ends. And now... Three evenings of Roderick Hudson appearing on my cousin's veranda, bringing to life the light and the shadows, has stirred a passionate intensity in me. I feel a kindness for him. His zest, artistry and youth are all indefinably attractive. A Sunday in August, Cecilia is on her way to church, and Roderick and I go for a walk. Remember the day, and take care to rob no orchards. I have my hat. Godspeed, Cecilia Mallet. I shall see you anon. Though not at church, I don't like the company. <laughs> we walk for half an hour and then lie in the shade of a tree. Stretched out, he's like a beautiful, supple, bright-eyed animal. You smoke, Roderick. Would you like a cigar? No, thank you. They're vile things. I cannot see how decent people tolerate them. <laughs> Ah, it's beautiful here, isn't it? And here am I about to leave. It's a wretched business, this practical quarrel of ours with our own country. 
this everlasting impatience to get out of it. This is an American day, an American landscape, an American atmosphere. Uh, someday when I'm shivering with ague in classic Italy, I shall accuse myself of having slighted them. Well, Roland, America is good enough for me. I think it the duty of an honest citizen to stand by his country and help it along. After, after the skirmish that tore at us, I'm an advocate for American art. We're the biggest people, and we'll create the greatest works in the world. The biggest conceptions bring about the biggest performances. I declare there's a career for a man, and I've 20 minds to decide on the spot to embrace it, to be the consummate, original, typical, national American artist. It's inspiring. <laughs> I think a saner impulse inspired your water drink. Sometimes a man needs to make declarations, even though the declarations may change. How would you like to go to Rome? I would like it. And I should like to go to Athens, to Constantinople, to Damascus. Nay, if you were to go to Rome, you would have to settle down and work. Well, it will take time to arrange details and pack my trunk. If you mean to turn sculptor, the sooner you pack, the better. What is the smallest sum per annum which one could keep alive the sacred fire in Rome? What is the largest sum at your disposal? Oh, three hundred dollars. Well, there are ways of raising money. Are there? I'm a lawyer in training, and I have never yet discovered one. One which I recommend consists in a friend with a good deal more money than he wants and not being too proud to accept part of it. Do you mean... Do you mean... I'm fond of fine statues, but cannot make them myself. I have to order them. I hereby order a dozen from you to be executed at your convenience. A dozen? And I'll pay you in advance. I will take you to Rome, walk you through the Vatican, and then lock you up with a heap of clay. I sail on the 5th of September. Can you be ready by then? <laughs> we should travel together. You believe in me? I believe in you if you're prepared to work and wait and struggle. I simply offer you the opportunity. You've not seen my other things. Come and look at them. Now? Yes! Yes, we'll walk home. We'll settle the question. And as he passes his arm through mine, I feel him trembling. Upon my word, Roderick, they all seem to me very good. Hmm. The effort in each is signally powerful and intelligent. Look at this piece. And this, <laughs> you have only to work. Uh, then let me do one act of contrition for time spent working at the law. Look, look, here is a bust I was making of my employer. A good enough man, but it's what he now represents. No! <sighs> oh, it was still a good work. Never destroy such a good piece, Roderick. I didn't mean you to do this. Roderick! What have you done here? Snapped my chains, ended my obligation to the law. Why express it in such a fashion? Because there was no other fitting fashion. Well, you had best sweep it clean. Oh, who was that young lady? Your relative? You didn't introduce us, Roderick. Oh, that's Mary Garland, a distant cousin. She's staying with us for a few months. She was too annoyed to have borne being introduced. Oh, I suppose you had better sweep these pieces up, as Miss Garland said. Mm, some of my employer is still recognizable. Not anymore! Roland! Are you awake, Roland? <clears throat> Roland! <clears throat> what is it? I've had a domestic struggle. After you'd gone, I had to talk to my mother, and she takes things terribly hard. Come out. Let us walk about. What about work? Shouldn't you be at your office? I've shaken the dust of law from my feet. I am lawless. A law unto myself. I'm coming out. So, Roderick. Walk. Walk with me. You see, I was born to displease her. She has always had this way of regarding me through tears. The trouble is, I have been too absurdly docile, and my mother has grown used to bullying me. Bullying? No, no. That is maternal love. It wells up, 
If I'm not in my bed by 11 o'clock, that girl is sent out to explore with a lantern. That girl? Mary. Mary Garland. You saw her disapproving look last night. I despise my amiability. It's rather hard fair to live like a saint and to pass for a sinner. I should like to lead the kind of life, if only for six months, that others lead their mothers. There are worse fates than being loved too well. I have to be my brother as well as myself. When we were both young together, I was the curled darling. I had the biggest piece of pudding. I stayed indoors to be kissed by the ladies while Stephen was outside making mud pies. And they never missed him. The female relatives, they never missed him, never noticed he wasn't there. I did. I felt it and knew it. Really, Stephen Hudson was worth 50 of me, and when he was brought home from Vicksburg with a piece of shell in his skull, my poor mother began to think she hadn't loved him enough. She hung round my neck, sobbing by his coffin, and told me I must be to her everything that he would have been. I swore in tears and perfect good faith that I would. Naturally, I've not kept my promise. I've been utterly indifferent, idle, restless, egotistical, discontented. Stephen, if he'd lived, would have earned $50,000 and put gas and water into the house. Oh, you must lose no time in making a masterpiece. Then, with the proceeds, you can give her gas from golden burners. I told her. She cried for an hour. She can see no good in my making statues. They are a snare of the enemy. I owe your mother some amends. Will it be possible for me to see her? Yes. If you see her, it will smooth matters vastly. Though she considers you an agent of the foul fiend, and she says Rome in the same whisper as you'd say damnation. I guess your mother sees Northampton as the center of the earth. That's it. And the young woman, your cousin, Miss Garland? I should like to know what she thinks. Miss Garland thinks what I think. Mr. Mallet, may I present my mother, Mrs. Hudson, and my cousin, Miss Garland? Mrs. Hudson? Miss Garland? In a gloomy room, Mrs. Hudson is sunk low in her chair, and Mary Garland's gaze is the most effective greeting I receive. Mrs. Hudson, I have come on business. Mother has the fullest details, Roland. Mr. Mallet? Yes. I suppose it's better that I see you. Perhaps you should take a seat? Oh, not that one. Oh, I did not see that you had your silks hanging from his back, ready to wind, Miss Garland. The, uh, the light here is... Um... What passes for darkness in other houses. I will take my leave of you now, as I have to go on an errand, but I will be back. If I can sit here, then I can help. I can hold the skeins myself. <laughs> she stares at me in amazement. I doubt you would wind them to the tension I require, but thank you. She's deadly serious, though I imagine she has a radiant smile. I have become so very intimate with your son, Mrs. Hudson, that it seems just that I should make your acquaintance. Very just. You have known him how long? Three days. Three days is correct. No time. I see what he is, who he might become. I expect, in a short time, the world to know him too, to be a... A great man, a great artist. We had hopes for Roderick, but they stopped short of greatness. I'm afraid that you now see me as an enemy. Mr. Mallet, my aunt is no one's enemy. I have stirred up your son's ambition, Mrs. Hudson, on a line that leads him so far from home. How do you study sculpture? By looking at models and imitating them. At what models? Antique. The antique. I have heard that the antique is generally some sort of pagan god with dirt sticking to it. No arms, no nose, and no clothing. <laughs> uh, that is a, a good description of many. One of the reasons for studying in Rome is that it is a handsome place. You find very well-made people. Are the Roman women very beautiful? On the whole, I prefer ours. Hmm. My cousin suffers many lazy reveries. He already stares at a good many models. The frost on the window pane, Flies going about their buzzing. They may well feed into his ability to put clay into an attitude. Put clay into an attitude? And he has power? Gifts? Talent. But how can you be sure? 
Oh, I suppose one can believe. And you believe? Well, I believe. It's a bit like a fairy tale. You arrive so rich and so polite, and you carry off my cousin in a golden cloud. Roderick is a little strange. He has never been an easy boy. Sometimes I feel like the goose. Wasn't it the goose, Mary, my dear, that hatched a swan's egg? It might even have been a hen. I know very little about the world, and I never suspected that it contained persons of such liberality as yours, Mr. Mallet. Roderick is all I have. Well, so far as I can help him, he shall succeed. You really do think he will do great things? I do. Well, we will think about that, Mr. Mallet, as we sit here all alone. The row of white houses seemed to glance back at me disapprovingly in the broken moonshine. Am I meddling with this little New England home? And something else disturbs me. I'm affected by this woman, Mary Garland, and I don't know how or why. If Roderick were to paint an American picture or mold an American statuette that told of every impressive and open grace this country has, he could find no finer muse than Miss Mary Garland. I will visit again. Mrs. Hudson, I am sure, would like some more reassurance. And I should like to spend time, even diluted by other company, with Mary Garland. I would hope to make a better impression next time than my tangling her sewing skeins. This was your idea, Roland, to have a family picnic? I'm not sure how the suggestion came about, Cecilia, but we all concur. <laughs> it's a lovely way to see Roderick off on the adventure. On the perilous and arduous trek to make the most of his talents. <laughs> I shall miss him. Miss Garland, excuse me. I should enjoy your company for a brief while. You can give your aunt your society at any time, but perhaps you'll never see me again. I should like for us to part as friends. Why, then, should we wish to be friends if nothing is to come of it? If we can be friends for half an hour, it is so much gain. Would you care to walk a little way with me? Do you really expect never to come back to Northampton again? If I should return to America, I will come here. Cecilia is all that remains of my family. But very little ties me to a place. I, I have no work. I come from a place where everyone has plenty. We all work. Everyone I know works. I look at you with curiosity. You are the first unoccupied man I ever saw. Don't look at me too hard. I shall sink into the earth. Don't you know how to do anything? Have you no profession? I was a soldier, briefly. But now, absolutely none. What do you do all day? I do nothing. So now you're going to Europe entirely for Roderick's sake? Yes. Yes, I am now. Alone and serving myself, I might have postponed my trip. And you mean to do a great deal for him? Whatever I can. But my power is very small beside his power of helping himself. Mm. You're very generous. At first, I don't think you would have paid me that compliment. You distrusted me. I... I didn't see why you would wish to make Roderick discontented. I thought you were rather frivolous. You did me an injustice. I don't think I'm that. It was because you were unlike other men, those, at least, you might have seen. Well, I'm not frivolous. I hope not. I shall often think about you, Mary. Mary! Paul. Mary, I want to speak to you to make my proper goodbyes. Come with me. <laughs> you do everything at a breakneck pace, Roderick. I do, I do. I told you, Roland, it's the fiend in me. Come along, Mary. <laughs> Why should I meet her now? Why has fate condemned me to meet her now? Just as I'm leaving the country for years. Am I turning my back on a chance of happiness? We sailed to Europe. 
The weather remained fine and we always sat side by side on the deck late into the evening. Slowly, and it seemed to me by stealth, we had no secrets from one another. Then, one evening, Roderick seemed to have something on his conscience. I must tell you something. I thought we'd exhausted our stock of revelations. I want you to know because you will be glad to know it. You may have even guessed it. Or given a couple of months in my company, it would have become obvious. What is it that I should have guessed? I am engaged to Mary Garland. The sea is calm, but it seems to me that the ship gives a dizzying lurch. I never imagined... That I was in love with her? Neither did I. Until you came and put me in such a ridiculous good humor that I felt an extraordinary desire to tell someone that I adored them. I have been falling in love with her without being conscious of it. And she appeared to me so magnificent and kind. So the thing was settled. I suppose I wanted a blessing on my career, and that is how I came by one. That is a, a price to pay for a blessing. I know. I, I have tied myself to a person when all my life I have fought the limitations of family. And all for the blessing of this enterprise. Oh, but I had to. I had to. I was so happy. Fortune has played me an elaborately devised trick. It has lured me out into mid-ocean and smoothed the sea and stilled the winds and given me a singularly receptive and sympathetic companion. And then it has turned and delivered me a thumping blow in mid-chest. I am a very happy man. Yes, I'm mm. sure you are. I must get to bed. Good night, Roland. Good night. I am lost. Lost in a point somewhere between the sea and the sky. Lost. Quite, quite lost. Rome flows over a person like a breathable river. All the time that was here, all the art, it's a river that waits to wash over the next generation, to wet them with its current, don't you think? I mean, Mallet, what terrible resplendent spectacles of life and death happened here at the Colosseum. Now, Michelangelo's Moses made me defiant. I fought his stare. I knew it was not an inscrutable mystery. The coloring of Titian and Veronese almost made me lose my footing. And then there was the Basilica de Santa Maria Maggiore and mosaics that fidget their way into your soul. Roland Mallet, I have seen too much. <laughs> I have an indigestion of impressions. I must work them off before I go in for any more. I'm like the snake. My repast will take me a month to digest. Creating art is using the energy these great pieces draw from me to create my own masterpieces. You can but try. Success is only passionate effort. Well, the passion is blazing. We have been piling on fuel handsomely. It came over me just now that it's exactly three months to the day since I left Northampton. To get to Roderick's studio, the walk takes us via a route of black archways and moldy little terraces overhanging the Tiber. Terraces littered with shapeless fragments of sculpture and meager orange trees in terracotta tubs, whilst the unclean historic river whispers below. In the distance stands the Rotunda of San Angelo, tipped with its seraphic statue, and behind that, the Dome of St. Peter's and the broad-topped pines of the Villa Doria. The studio is crumbling, shabby, melancholic. Everything is picturesque. It suits him perfectly. I not noticed before, Roderick, there are vague traces of old frescoes on the ceiling. In the twilight, I can sometimes make out floating draperies and clasping arms. Can you? But look at me, Roland. Surely I haven't the same face. Look, I have a different eye, a different voice, a different expression. Can you tell how much I've changed? Well, I've lived through the transition. Miss Garland would notice it more. 
and I still see Miss Garland as freshly in my mind as though we had only just left her. Miss Garland would say I was corrupted. But, you know, I feel I have uh, an historic consciousness. <laughs> I, I see further than my own time. And yet I am young, so well, young. You don't see the limits. They say old people find themselves face to face with a solid blank wall and stand thumping against it in vain. You are younger than I have ever been. Youth and genius hand in hand. I am to live freely here because everything is art. I am handing over my entire life to my genius, as you call it. Wherever I take him, he causes a stir. People find him puzzling at parties, which he takes to like a duck to water. I'm only there to point out the shallows and pitfalls. The Discobolus at the Vatican shows the perfect position of a man about... The man would topple forward. His weight's all wrong. Roderick, let our host finish speaking. When all I can hear is the guidebook's errors being repeated. So where do you hail from, Madame Grandoni? You seem to know everyone here and... Roderick, you haven't been formally introduced. Allow me to... Uh... I know what she's called. I've heard enough about her to surmise that my conversation may be of some interest. There are many wise heads who see him as a Yankee crudity and accuse him of dancing before he can walk, but his sculptures. And I have traveled to the Carrara quarries and brought back the most magnificent marble, are exquisite. I see in the streets, in the country, I read and hear just missed half expressions and mold them to my own. Are those letters all from Miss Garland? Yes. I have almost the same number for my cousin, Cecilia. Cecilia reports that Mrs. Hudson always speaks of Roderick with tears in her eyes. And Mary, when Roderick's name is mentioned, listens with a suffusion of pink in her cheeks. Roland, pass me that cloth. Enter. I trust we are at liberty to enter. <laughs> We were told that Mr. Hudson had no fixed day and that we might come at any time to his studio for a viewing. Oh, but please, let us not disturb you. Are they just coming to look at me as they would any piece of Rome they thought they might investigate to pass the time? Yes. I have been in many a studio. You've uh, probably lost count of the number. We are going about everywhere. Mrs. Light is passionately fond of art. Rome should satiate that passion. <laughs> I discovered an opportunity to snag his ribbons. Oh, immortal powers. What a vision. In the name of transcendent perfection, who is she? She is beauty itself. A revelation sent by Juno. A phantasm. A vapor from Mount Olympus. I hope at least she has no connection with Mephistopheles. She looks dangerous. If beauty is immoral, as the good people of Northampton believe, then she is the incarnation of evil. Tell the young woman to speak again. I want to know what beauty sounds like. I don't want to be disappointed. They can hear you, Roderick. I don't mind. I wish to have the goddess as my model. But not her dog. She has made an idiot out of it. He is a very valuable dog. A nobleman presented him to her. Stenterello, the poodle, is decked like a sacrificial ram. His haunches are transparent pink. His fleecy head and shoulders as white as jeweler's cotton, primped and beribboned. His tail and ears ornamented with long blue ribbons, one now a little longer than the other. He seems conscious of his spectacle and stands with solemnity beside his beautiful mistress. They all start to wander around the studio, admiring the statues. Mm. But who are they all? Oh, I mean... That. They are a social assortment. I imagine that little old man is not the papa. He's Roman, a hanger-on of the American mama, a useful personage who now and again gets invited to dinner. The ladies are from the north. I cannot guess exactly where. Oh, look at this. Is there more light? Let me put the lamp closer. This is exceptional. I have seen nothing better than this, and I have visited very many studios. Eve? Well, who would mind someone so beautiful being mother of us all? I'm just a novice. I don't have an exhibition to show you. What you see is, well, it's all my work. 
But I would do my best work making a bust of... of... Miss Light. I had rather you made the poodles. <laughs> He's Florentine and the dogs are handsomer than the people in Florence. Is it very tiresome sitting for an artist? I have spent half my life sitting for my photograph in every conceivable attitude with every conceivable coiffure. Thank you. I, I think I've posed enough. Oh, twenty years ago, my husband had me painted in all my jewels. Rome was select. Now the railroads have brought in all the Bulgarians. May I make a bust of your daughter, Mrs. Light? Mama, he wishes to make a bust of me. <laughs> I would say that he would be most likely to do his subject justice. A bust? Clothed. She must be clothed. Mother. Yes. Yes. I have paid a good deal to dress her fashionably and elegantly, and I would like to have the expense recorded in marble. What a mama, eh, Roderick? Mine sculpts me in tears that she wrings from her handkerchief. We are looking for a husband for me. A husband? You won't do. You might have genius, but you have not been elevated by society, and your family does not have an elevated history. A title, great wealth, grounds. True, but I believe I have something else. Your hair, your eyes. Now I feel like a beggar. Oh, some better girl than I will decide, after mature reflection that you have enough... Let me model you, and then let he who can marry you. As to my daughter sitting to you, sir, to a young sculptor whom we don't know, it is a matter that needs reflection. It is not a favor that is to be had for the mere asking. If I don't make her from life, I will make her from memory. And if the thing's to be done, you had better have it done as well as possible. Mama hesitates because she doesn't know whether you mean she shall pay for the bust. I can assure you that she will not pay you a sou. Oh, Christina. <laughs> if you are not afraid to come and see two quiet little women, we shall be most happy. We have no statues or pictures. We have nothing but each other, hmm, darling? I beg your pardon. Oh, and the Cavalieri. <laughs> oh, you are too kind. <laughs> Mama, the poodle, please. <laughs> you can work on the bust at our simple villa. Come along, Christina. Goodbye. She's a goddess. She is all the more dangerous. Dangerous? What would she do to me? She doesn't bite, I imagine. Before Roderick sits Christina Light. In a white dress, with her shoulders bare, her magnificent hair twisted into a classic coil, and her head admirably poised. She looks divinely beautiful. Ah, your hair slipped. It's too heavy to stay pinned. Ow! I, I, I want the shape again. Stop! Stop! Don't touch her. Mama's not really shocked. She's only afraid that Mr. Hudson might have injured my hair and that, per consequenza, I should sell for less. Oh, you unnatural child. You deserve that I should make a fright of you. Now, stay still while I repin you. Hudson's a sculptor, but if I were a painter... Thank heaven you're not. I'm having quite enough of this minute inspection. Besides, I could never trust you, Mr. Mallet. I think it's because your face is so broad. For some reason or other, broad faces exasperate me. They fill me with a kind of rabia. Last summer at Carlsbad, there was an Austrian count with enormous estates and some great office at court. He was very attentive, seriously so. He was really very far gone. C'est l'année que moi. But I couldn't. He was impossible. He must have measured from ear to ear at least a yard and a half. And he was blonde, too, which made it worse. As blonde as Dantarello, pure fleece. So I said to him, frankly, Many thanks, Herr Graf. Your uniform is magnificent, but your face is too fat. Yes, my face, too, seems to have assumed an unpardonable latitude. Oh, Christina... Oh, Mama, they know very well that we are looking for a husband and that none but tremendous swells need apply. Surely before these gentlemen, Mama, I may speak freely. They are disinterested. Mr. Mallet won't do because, although he's rich, he's not rich enough, and he has a broad, fat face. Unless you have millions, you know, you have no chance. Mr. Hudson, of course, is nowhere. He has nothing but his genius in his bosier. Now, keep still, Christina. Mr. Hudson's fingers are attempting to catch you and draw you out of the clay. Oh, but when you're in marble, when you're the finest Italian marble and set against a red velvet backdrop, 
I am within your shot, Christina. Always. If only Mama's ears were made of marble. A red velvet backdrop? Won't that have something of the opera about it? No, Mr. Mallet. It'll be quite the shop front display with no visible price tag. The cost to be given only on inquiry. Your beauty and my genius. The one constant and the other always in need of the exemplary subject. I have other exemplary subjects. So you keep telling me. Now you mustn't expect any more conversation from me, Mr. Hudson. Silencio, work. Imagine, Mr. Mallet, my surface is forming beneath your protege's fingers. It is a very direct thought. <laughs> <laughs> the bust was thoroughly a portrait, not a vague fantasy of a pretty woman. The resemblance was deep and vivid, with detail and simplicity, and half the foreign colony came to see it. It was a great success. Roderick's visits to the light household, however, did not decrease nor his musings on her. He talked about her a lot. It has taken 20 years of Europe to make Christina what she is. She is a product of the old world. She has an atmosphere. Well, young unmarried women should be careful not to have too much of that. And what about your Miss Garland? She is the opposite. She has a depletion. Miss Garland has a scent. Miss Light... An atmosphere. Four weeks of almost constant companionship makes you an expert. And did I mention I'm running out of money? Could you advance me some for statues 13 to 20? Does Miss Light know about Miss Garland? No. Why should she? You're spending half your time in Mrs. Light's drawing room. You're being talked about as attentive to Christina. The success of the bus might have restored your equanimity, but you do not have the moral freedom to attach yourself to another young woman. She is, as I said, unsafe. She is a complex, willful, passionate creature, not unsafe. Her mother's throwing a ball in her honor. I intend to dance every dance with her. I must. Art demands it. Mr. Mallet, I have worked the whole of the room to reach you. I thought you disliked me for my fat face. Ah, oh, yes, I dislike you. To tell the truth, I had forgotten it. There are so many people here whom I dislike more that when I spied you just now, you seemed like an intimate friend. I am frightfully egotistical, but I find myself so vastly more interesting than nine-tenths of the people I meet. And yet you meet so many. But your friend Hudson, he has such bad manners, but is he a genius? Yes. Do you think he will become very famous? Oh, he has such eyes that you can forgive him for his bad manners. I suppose that is what they call the sacred fire. What are you frowning at? There is another person, the most important of all. The young girl to whom he is engaged. Oh. Mr. Hudson is engaged. Is she pretty? Why I came over, why I sought you out, is to ask you to tell Mr. Hudson to stop sitting with me. To stop following me around. Thank you. There she stands in her incomparable beauty, and Roman princes come and bow to her. Here, in his corner, her old master permits himself to be proud. It is very friendly of him. Ah, it is very natural, signore. The Cristina is a good girl. She remembers my little services. Oh, but here comes the young prince of the fine arts. I am sure he has bowed lowest of all. Have you seen her? I have seen Miss Light. She's magnificent. My poor friend. My poor, poor Roderick is shaking. Shaking with desire. I'm half crazy. If you will go away, leave the ball, I will go with you. Go away? I intend to dance with her. Why the deuce should I go away? Because you are in love. I might as well be in love here as in the streets. Carry your love as far as possible from Christina. She will not listen to you. She can't. She can't? She is not a person of whom you may say that. She can if she will. She does as she chooses. No, no, my dear young man. You do not know her better than I. You have not watched her day by day for 20 years. I, too, have admired her. 
She's a good girl. She has never said an unkind word to me, the Blessed Virgin, in fact. But she must have a brilliant destiny. It has been marked out for her, and she will submit. You had better believe me. It may save you much suffering. Well, she has found me. She has found me. Christina. Mr. Hudson. Quel surprise. Oh, oh my own darling. I have some dancing partners for you. Royalty, too. Roderick, give me your arm. My own darling. Well, I'll make your excuses then, Christina. But for this one dance, she cannot snub a prince like this too many times. He has his honor. I don't know whether you will thank me, but I told Miss Light about your engagement. Your duty is to Miss Garland. Remember her. I had no idea that Miss Garland had made such an impression on you. You are too zealous. I take it she didn't charge you to look after her interests. If anything happens to you, I am accountable. You must understand that. I know all I owe you. I feel it. You know that. But I am not a small boy nor an outer barbarian any longer, and whatever I do, I do with my eyes open. I can deal with Mary myself. When you err, you say the faults your own. It is because your faults are your own that I care about them. You are the best man in the world, and I am a vile brute. Only you don't understand me. I think that when you expect a man to produce beautiful and wonderful works of art, you ought to allow him a certain freedom of action. You ought to give him a long rope. You ought to let him follow his fancy and look for his material wherever he thinks he may find it. An artist can't bring his visions to maturity unless he has a certain experience. If you want a bird to sing, you must not cover up its cage. Shoot them, the poor devils. Drown them. Exterminate them. But if you suffer them to live, let them live on their own terms and according to their own inexorable needs. <laughs> I have no wish, whatever, either to shoot you or to drown you. Oh, I can't work now. Come on, let's go out and get some air. Let's walk. I need air. Light. I need distraction. I feel like I am face to face with the dead blank of my mind. What if the watch should run down and you should lose the key? Roland Mallet, what are you smiling at so damnably? Nothing. Please. Continue. The end of my work shall be the end of my life. I have a conviction that when the hour strikes here, my heart, my head, I shall disappear, dissolve, be carried off in the cloud. For the past ten days, I have had the vision of some such fate perpetually swimming before my eyes. My mind is like a dead calm in the tropics. My imagination is as motionless as the phantom ship in the ancient mariner. Don't heed your mood. There is no calm so dead that your own lungs can't ruffle it with a breeze. If you have work to do, don't wait to feel like it. Set to work and you will feel like it. <laughs> Set to work and produce abortions. Preach that to others. I won't do second-rate work. This is unprofitable talk. It makes my head ache. Oh, that's... Christina! Hmm. Miss Light. And sheep. Mr. Hudson and Mr. Mallet. Your sheepdog. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where is Mrs. Light and the Cavalieri? Oh, Christina. Oh. Oh. Christina. Oh, Santarello is so undeniably strong. He has drawn Christina away from our path. And look what the poodle has found. Come along, Christina. Prince Cassimassima is waiting. Mr. Hudson, will you walk me through the glade? Well, Mama, you have blankets. Make a nest for the prince and sit down. But, uh, Christina. It was an awkward wait. Prince Casimassima stood a little apart from us. He remained bolt upright and watchful, his eyes searching the glade. Look at him, Mr. Mallet. He has just come of age. He bears one of the greatest names in Italy and owns one of the greatest properties. And he is pining away with love for my daughter. An hour passes slowly. <laughs> oh, Christina! Couldn't you have walked a little faster? You've had us all waiting. Oh, one would think we are prisoners of the Inquisition. The Colosseum always draws me. And when the custodian opens the heavy wooden gate and tips his hat, I am certain that he recognizes the ones whose senses crave the views. 
It's a long time since I ascended to the ruinous upper tiers of the Great Circus. If what you say is true, you are simply weak. Roderick and Miss Light, should I call out? Let them know I'm here. I'm not weak. I may be incomplete. Incomplete, then. It is the same thing. How can it be the same thing? It keeps you from your splendid achievement. Oh, you make me think I shall never know what I have so often dreamed of. What is that? A man who I can perfectly respect. A man I can unrestrictedly desire. When I first met you, I fancied that you had the sacred fire. Before heaven, I believe I have. Oh, but so little. It flickers and trembles and splutters. It goes out, you tell me, and for whole weeks together. From your own account, it's ten to one. You're a failure. I say those things sometimes to myself. Hearing you say them makes me feel I could work twenty years at one sitting on purpose to refute you. That man I would call strong would neither rise nor fall by anything I say. I have no strength myself, and I can give you no strength. I am a miserable medley of vanity and folly. I am ignorant. I am false. I am the fruit of a horrible education sown on a worthless soil. Oh, why have you been at such pains to assure me you are an undistinguished man and not a great one? Your eyes declared that you were strong, but your voice about my voice it condemns you. It is not the voice of a conqueror. Then give me something to conquer, Roderick. No, no, Miss Light is dangerous. She is playing with you. Yes. Give me something to conquer. Now I speak from my soul. Whatever you think of my voice, you pretend devotion, but I'm sure you have never chosen between me and that person you are attached to in America. Do me the favor not to speak of her. Well, why not? I say no ill of her, and I think all kinds of good. I am certain she is far better girl than I, and far more likely to make you happy. This is happiness. This present palpable moment. Though you have such genius for saying the things that torture me, you have never faced the fact that you are false, that you have broken your faith. I say you have never chosen. You are afraid to choose. I believe that you don't really care for your friend in America any more than you do for me. You only care for yourself. That is all very well if you are capable of making something great. If you have any doubts about yourself, I cannot reassure you. I have too many doubts about everything in this weary world. You have gone up like a rocket in your profession. They tell me, are you going to come down like the stick? And when you tell me with a full confidence you feel terribly small, why I can only answer, ah, then, my friend, I am afraid you are small. What I should like to hear from a certain person is the language of absolute decision. <sighs> Do you see that? What have you seen, Christina? My muse descending to reacquaint herself with me. That little flower. Where? It's outlined against the dark niche in which it grows. It is intensely blue. Oh, what a lovely color it is! Would you like me to have it? Would you like to have it? Don't look as though you would eat me up. It's harmless if I say yes. Would you like it? <laughs> I will bring it to you. It is some twenty feet above, at the top of an immense fragment of wall. The sheer face is doing a very reasonable impression of a rugged alpine cliff. Are you crazy? Do you mean to kill yourself? I shall not kill myself. Sit down. Excuse me, not till you do. Go there. I implore you, don't. Sit down. No, please don't. He is climbing a crazy journey. He's trying to climb the remains of a vanished cornice. I cannot let him risk his life. Ah. Don't be alarmed. I'm here. Let me help you up. It is an exploit for spiders. Here, give me your hand.、Uh, Roland. Yeah.、Uh. Christina, I have made you obey me. Am I weak now, Mr. Mallet? Would you be so good as to show me the way out of this horrible place, Mr. Hudson, Mr. Mallet? Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Light. Goodbye. I overheard sufficient of your conversation to prove to you that I seem utterly infatuated, Miss Light. 
seemed to know just how far she could go to you. Yes. She was twisting you round her little finger. Playing you. Your crazy pursuit of that flower was proof that she could go all lengths in the way of making a fool of you. You do realize she was making a fool of yes. you? Yes. Yes, I realize. And what do you expect to come of it? Nothing good. And in the light of your most recent interview, what do you make of your young lady? If I could tell you that, it would be plain sailing. But she will not tell me again that I am weak. Are you sure you're not weak? If I am, she shall never know it. Very well. But promise me this. The next time you meet Miss Light, it shall be on the earth and not in the air. <laughs> you should fraternize more with the other artists. You need time to recover. I need fresh thoughts, new ideas. I need another source of hope. I am leaving tonight for a few weeks. Will you promise me that you'll work? Even if it's pointless? And the clay refuses to be anything but what it is, a twisted shovel full of damp earth. My brain is little more than a failed student lawyer's... Work! Trust yourself to work. I need more money. Find another patron. Go. Go wherever you intend going. I'm going. And I shall be wherever fate intends when you get back. Go! Go! Roderick Hudson was Luke Newbury, Roland Mallett, Derek Riddell, Christina Light, Emily Beecham, and Mrs. Light was Lorelei King. The Cavalieri was Stephen Marzella, Mrs. Hudson, Susan Twist, Cecilia, Kate Coogan, and Mary Garland was Caitlin Thorburn. Roderick Hudson by Henry James was dramatized by Lavinia Murray and directed in Salford by Pauline Harris.